Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the organizers for not only inviting me, but for putting on this important forum today. Uh, I think it's one of the encouraging things over the last number of years is to see drug policy reform activists and advocates um, begin to engage with questions of treaty interpretation and flexibilities. I think it's a particularly important question as we try to engage member states on the options and limitations of flexibilities, obviously the importance of human rights engagement and oversight when it comes to looking at drug enforcement, and generally a, I think a particularly important part of, of the discussion as we try to move forward looking to develop a human rights-based approach to drug control. Uh, I'm going to review over the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes uh, just some of the work I've been doing uh, on the, an interpretive approach to balancing obligations in international drug control with obligations in international human rights law. Um, since I was speaking first, I thought I'd just do a little really brief overview on the whole topic of the con of conflict of laws, which I think underpins a lot of this discussion and I think is perhaps not often understood uh, in the degree that we, we could do to be most useful. I mean, traditionally, when we talk about how different sets of laws engage with each other, um, they fall into two general categories. We talk about laws that can be complementary to each other or obligations between two regimes that are complementary. These are basically mean that those laws um, or those obligations and treaties um, reinforce one another. I mean, examples of that, you could say the 71 Drug Convention, for example, is complementary to the 61 Convention. It basically puts in place the same types of controls but ex expands the numbers of substances under control. Uh, similarly, you can have complementarities between regimes. So we can talk about obligations in the drug conventions around access to essential medicines and how that is complementary with similar obligations under the right to health in the human rights regime. Uh, or in other regimes, we can look at Article 17 of the 88 Convention, which is about suppressing traffic on the sea, um, which is complementary and sort of parallel to Article 108 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, so we have that exists between drug control and human rights. But of course, we also have conflict, conflict of law. Um, and again, traditionally, when we talk about a definition of a conflict of law, it's described as a situation where it's impossible for a state to be simultaneously compliant with two or more different obligations. So fulfilling the obligation of one treaty necessarily puts you in breach of another treaty. Um, and those, those conflicts do exist um, in drug control. I think they're quite few. I think Robert's going to talk about that. Um, but they do certainly exist, and they exist in international law. And this is where we get to the question of interpretation. How do we balance and resolve those conflicts? Um, the International Law Commission, uh, in its fragmentation report in 2006, talks about how in international law there's a strong presumption against normative conflict. And in a sense, when we do a process of interpretation, the preferable resolution to a conflict is a situation or a solution that is compliant with both regimes and not in conflict with others. So as sort of a first step um, to addressing issues of conflict, you know, the preferred way is one that balances both sets of obligations. Um, and as was more famously said uh, by the International Law Commission 40 years earlier, the interpretation process is to some extent an art and not an exact science. Um, but I think it's important to say that although it's not an exact science, it is a rational process. It's not a process of opinion or it's not a process of speculation. Uh, and that process is really defined in treaty law and in custom uh, in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I won't go into this in detail. This is Article 31, which is the general rule for interpretation. Uh, and I point this out just to sort of say that you know, we have Article 31, we have, I think, four sub-articles and a number of sub-sub-articles. Um, but the important part of this uh, in questions of interpretation is really the title. Uh, you notice it's the general rule of interpretation. It's not rules. Uh, it's singular, and that's not a typo. And sort of most uh, people working in the area of treaty interpretation will say that that's a purposeful thing. Uh, in the sense that the rule is about applying all of those things at the same time. It's not about picking one or two that we like and leaving out one or two that we don't like. We have to kind of take all of those into the mix or the crucible of interpretation when we're trying to look at these things and the various sources that they come from. And secondary sources, which can also be important, and I'll give an example of that later, of looking at things such as the specific drafting history of the treaties, essentially the minutes of the, of the process and how particular language might have been arrived at. 
significant to that process of interpretation is the sources. And again, we often sometimes see this confused. Um, and the sources of law for the process of interpretation are again set out very clearly in the Vienna Convention, particularly and primarily the text of the treaty itself, a good faith reading of the text um, in light of its object and purpose. Uh, in particular, if we're looking at a particular provision or an obligation within the treaty, uh, we have to look at the context in which that provision sits within the treaty as a whole. Um, we have to see how it interrelates with other parts of the treaty, with the preamble of the treaty. So again, it's about not taking things out in isolation, but looking at them in their proper context. Significantly, I think, in the area of drugs and human rights, we need to look at other related international instruments, of course. So if we're looking at this, interpreting the 61 Convention, we also have to be, have cognizance of the 71 and 88. We need to be looking at General Assembly resolutions, CND resolutions, so other related areas. And similarly, within human rights instruments um, that might relate to drug control or areas that engage drug control. Uh, importantly, we have to be looking at subsequent agreements in state practice. Um, so not really always going back to historical records, but we need to look at how states interpret those today. That's very important. How have states and the, how have UN resolutions progressed in time? How are they interpreted today, not how they were interpreted before? Of course, other relevant rules of international law. And again, I said as a supplementary means, we can look at the drafting history. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning the traditional way of looking at conflict of laws is we have complementarities and conflicts. Uh, I sort of argue in the context of drug control that the much bigger area that relates to human rights is what my colleague Damon Barrett has defined as tensions. These are areas in which human rights are being violated at country level, but those, um, those rights abuses aren't necessarily prescribed in the drug control treaties themselves, but have to do with how states interpret their own domestic um, implementation of those treaties. So we have human rights abuses that are emerging from the drug control regime. Um, you could argue in many ways are fueled by a lot of the rhetoric around drug control and the kind of um, you know, sort of excessive language we often see about drug control and the scourge of drugs and the threat of drugs, um, but they're not actually specifically directed by the treaties. They're about how the states implement them. And again, I think Robert will talk to some of this. This is really the biggest area that many of us have to deal with when it comes to domestic human rights violations. So the question then, how, how do we determine and how do we adjudicate those tensions? Uh, because in some cases, we have high courts justifying human rights abuses based upon drug conventions. I mean, very famously, the Indonesian Constitutional Court a few years ago defended, a, well, threw out a challenge to the mandatory death penalty for drugs by citing its, the state's obligations under the 88 Convention and saying the obligations under the 88 Convention essentially trumped the human rights law. Um, so again, that's an example of how those tensions can actually be manipulated and I, th I would argue um, badly, badly judged. Um, part of understanding this conflict and resolving it is going back to the object and purpose. Um, now the object and purpose of a treaty is technically looked at as a single term, uh, but I tend to look at it in two components. I and mean, this is very much driven by some of the French legal theorists who tend to break up the object and the purpose into both a utilitarian object and purpose, which is kind of the normative content of the treaty, um, and the obligations of the treaty, but then secondarily, uh, the telos, the ultimate aims or goals of the treaty, or what that normative framework is trending to, hopes to achieve. A good example of that is found in the Arms Trade Treaty, where it separately talks about the object and purpose. The object of the treaty is to put in place controls around and regulation of small arms, but the reason we want to control small arms is to contribute to international and regional peace and security. So you have the object is contributing to the purpose of the regime. And I would argue that that's actually a useful framework for looking at the drug conventions. Um, I would argue that we have this utilitarian object and purpose that we're all very familiar with of limiting um, the control of drugs or the use and production and distribution of drugs to medical and scientific purposes. Uh, of course, this is something we see throughout um, the modern UN system. This is uh, general obligations under Article 4 of the 61 Convention, for example. But we also find that object back in the earlier drug control treaties, the 1912 Opium Convention, the 1925 Opium Convention, both talk about limiting the availability of opium in that regard to medical and scientific purpose. But again, that should then contribute to the broader overarching goal, which would be sort of promote health and welfare. And this is when we get into questions of human rights very specifically, because health and welfare to me are not drug control objectives. They're not measured in drug control terms. These are human rights terms. And you measure the existence or absence of health and welfare using human rights indicators. And the presence or absence of drugs does not necessarily equate with the presence or absence of health and welfare. 
Uh, and again, we see this very much as people will be familiar with the preambles to the 61 and 71 conventions, both talk about being concerned with the health and welfare of mankind. Um, unfortunate choice of words, but there you are, humankind. Uh, and this again comes back to previous language in the earlier treaties that very much talked about drug control as being a humanitarian endeavor um, between states. And because of this, because of this overarching between um, kind of the object and the purpose, I argue in favor of a, a dynamic interpretation to questions and interpretation where drug control overlaps with human rights. Uh, of course, dynamic interpretation is something that's very familiar within international human rights law. It's very well established, the idea that how we understand an obligation in international law evolves along with how society understands a certain issue or a certain question. Uh, it's less well established in other areas of international law, but it does exist. We see it in, in sometimes in the work of the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. We've seen it in the European Court of Justice. And we've also seen it, importantly, in the International Court of Justice. And I'll sort of rely on this at this point in time because, of course, the International Court of Justice is the highest international court. It's also the court um, that's specified to adjudicate uh, issues within the drug control regime itself. Um, Sandra Torp Ellison, who's now uh, Helmerson, sorry, who's now at the University of Oslo, talks about dynamic interpretation and the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice as falling into two types, one being he calls value-driven and the other non-value-driven. Value-driven comes from originally the advisory opinion on Namibia, where they were looking at the covenant of the League of Nations. And they decided that in this particular case, they were referring to some of the language in the covenant. And they decided that statements such as the well-being and development of peoples, for example, was by very nature a value-laden term. And that was inevitably something that should be intended to evolve over time, understanding of development, understanding of health and well-being develop over time. So it speaks to underlying values. Uh, but he also describes a non-value-driven approach, again, dating back to the case of Costa Rica versus Nicaragua, where you can have an evolutive approach or a dynamic approach to understanding international legal obligations where those obligations are quite generic. And if they're generic terms describing a class of activities, that will inevitably evolve over time. And I would argue that both of those actually fit very neatly um, within the international drug control regime. We have kind of the value-driven approach, this health and welfare of humankind as being an overriding value. Fits very neatly. It's almost the identical language in some ways as the covenant of the League of Nations. And of course, the medical and scientific purposes object falls very neatly within a non-value-driven parameter. It uh, describes a class of activities. We can, I think, argue quite obviously that medical and scientific purposes are something that by definition evolve. Medical knowledge, scientific knowledge is always evolving by the nature of it. And just to conclude what this would mean in terms of treaty interpretation, again, if we have a dynamic human rights-based approach to addressing those tensions at country level, we take something such as the death penalty for drug offenses. Obviously not something that is prescribed in treaty, even though quite a few countries have it in law and quite a number of people are executed in a small number of states. Um, but if we're trying to balance again and get to the point where the correct interpretation or the most correct interpretation is one uh, being compliant with both treaty regimes, well, it's quite clear the death penalty for drugs is not mandated by the drug control treaties, and it quite clearly violates human rights treaties. So not having the death penalty for drugs doesn't violate anything. Having the death penalty for drugs violates international human rights law. So the correct balancing act for what should have been the Indonesian Constitutional Court, for example, should have been uh, the abolition of the death penalty for drug offenses. We can say similar things under compulsory drug detention. Of course, one of the, I guess, innovations of the modern drug control regime are state obligations around the provision of drug treatment. And in some ways, that's interpreted as mass compulsory drug detention. Uh, and again, we can see using a same framework, we know very clearly that that type of involuntary arbitrary detention clearly violates international human rights law. Compulsory detention is not mandated by the treaties. And this is an example we're going back into the supplementary um, sources of law are very useful. We can see in the drafting of the 61 Convention, there was actually a debate over whether the 61 Convention should mandate compulsory treatment in closed settings as the language of the treaty. The U.S. pushed it very hard. It was debated and it was thrown out. So that's a very clear example. We're going back actually into how those words were chosen. We can see, well, they actually debated compulsory detention and for a variety of reasons decided that that wasn't the case. Um, so. Uh, Shameless plug of my book, which will be coming out later. Richard Elliott bought the first copy, so thank you, Richard. Um, 
Anyway, I hope I haven't gone over time, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I now give the floor to Marsha. Let me start by thanking the organizers to, uh, uh, to, to having invited me here um, and to uh, be able to present uh, our research, uh, research that we recently published, um, 2016, in, uh, in, in, uh, in summer. Uh, I have done uh, two studies with uh, Professor Pieter Hein van Kempen uh, in the Netherlands, and you know that, and... Uh, uh, but also in other states, the um, important question now is that um, um, to what extent can states? Um, um, sorry, uh, to what extent can states regulate uh, recreational cannabis use or? possession or any kind of act, um, and to what extent is it allowed under international law? So that question we had uh, posed by, uh, uh, the question was posed by the uh, Dutch government, and we did two studies on that. And if you just look at the conventions, of course, you, always, uh, you obviously know that uh, there is no uh, room for regulating uh, cannabis for recreational use, um, but if you take a broader perspective of uh, international law and particularly uh, international human rights law, then we think a positive answer can be formulated. So in my intervention, I want to address two uh, questions that we have um, researched in our recent study, this last one. So I have 10 minutes, I think, and it's a book of almost 400 pages, so bear with me. Um, the two questions are, first of all, of course, the question, can a state be obliged to uh, regulate cannabis cultivation and trade for recreational use uh, on the basis of their positive human rights obligations for the protection of individual and public health, the security of citizens, crime control, if a such regulation would ensure a better and more effective protection of human rights than a prohibitive policy in conformity with the drug conventions. Uh, to the extent that such an obligation can be established, second question arises is to what extent states can give priority to, to their positive human rights obligations over and above any conflicting obligations arising from the drugs conventions. So to begin with our conclusion, in our book we answer both questions in the affirmative. States can be obliged to regulate cannabis for recreational use and states can give priority to their human rights obligations over and above any conflict in obligation with Uni United Nations drug conventions. Uh, to establish an obligation uh, to regulate cannabis for recreational use, two conditions according to us must be met. First of all, such regulation should protect interests that are relevant from the perspective of positive human rights obligations. In particular, we have looked at the right to health, the right to life, um, <laughs> right or protection against physical and mental harm, and the right to privacy. Uh, such relevance can be established with regard to arguments that states, uh, not only Netherlands, but other states too, hold and, uh, um, by saying that regulation of cannabis would better safeguard the quality of cannabis, would better regulate the monitoring of cannabis chain, uh, would reduce drug-related crimes, would better protect the health, life and physical and mental integrity and privacy of citizens against yeah, various hazards such as yeah, fires, water damage that are associated with illegal cannabis plantations and that directly, that's important, directly negatively affects people's lives. Having established that arguments presented by states in favor of regulation of cannabis for recreational use, uh, that are, these arguments are relevant from the human rights perspective, that does not in itself mean that an obligation under human rights law towards such regulation can be established. We argue that it's a strong argument is to be made towards establishing such an obligation when and only when a state can generally substantiate 
that cannabis regulation would better and more effectively fulfill the relevant positive human rights obligations that are derived from the, the rights that I just mentioned. Uh, for that, research and empirical data that we, uh, unfortunately, as lawyers have not considered is necessary. Clearly, uh, as of yet, no clear-cut deci decisive empirical evidence can be expected to be available in respect of many issues. Therefore, we argue that states should substantiate the greater effectiveness of regulation policy by using available scientific and other research data, um, and that is in turn evaluated in good faith in a sincere and reliable manner, providing for genuine analysis, argumentation, and consideration. Um, in the framework of the positive human rights obligations, each stage each state bears the primary responsibility to take all necessary, appropriate, and most effective measures for the protection of human rights. So the right to health, for example, requires states to take steps by all appropriate means in order to attain the full realization of the right of everybody, of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. If a state is able to substantiate the great effectiveness of a regulation policy for the enjoyment of human rights as compared to the policy of prohibition, it can proceed with a regulation if the regulation policy is based on national democratic decision-making processes in that state. Effectiveness of measures towards realization of human rights in part depends on peculiarities and constellations of each state and the extent to which certain measures enjoy societal support and are created by means of societal participation. In that, a state has a certain discretion, certain margin of appreciation to choose which most effective and appropriate steps to take. If and when a state can substantiate that a regulation policy would more effectively ensure uh, the protection of human rights, and that state decide by a democratic process that such policy would be most appropriate step to take, uh, the state can proceed to establish such regulation policy while setting aside conflicting obligations under the drug conventions to the extent to the extent that a harmonized interpretation is not visible. This conclusion is based on our finding that positive human rights obligation must be given priority over and above the conflicting obligations under the drug conventions. Um, this is substantiated uh, by each and, and a combination of the following arguments. First of all, we think that the protection of human rights must be seen as an obligation that follows from directly from the UN Charter and that must be given primacy over and above other conflicting obligations according to Article 103 of the UN Charter. That's the formal superiority position. Um, secondly, and short of the former uh, superiority, international human rights standards uh, on a more substantive level as a category of international norms are regarding as possessing a special status, so to say, or more weight as compared to other international norms, which conclusion follows from um, the object and purpose of uh, uh, major international organizations such as UN and Council of Europe, the system as such of public international law and the concepts um, uh, such as use Kogan's uh, customary norms, erga omnes, and integral obligations, and international judicial decisions. The prioritized position of human rights obviously does not invalidate in itself uh, the drug convention's obligations. Due to primacy of the principle of systemic integration, the presumption of com compatibility, and the presumption against conflict, what Rick just talked about, in international law, 
the drug control system must be interpreted in accordance with international human rights standards, which standards are recognized as an integral part of the system. Considering uh, the common, and here again I uh, almost quote you now, <laughs> considering the common object and purpose of human rights and drug control treaties, the practical goal of the drug control conventions towards minimizing transnational risk of drugs and maximizing international cooperation on the subject, and the human rights and constitutional clauses within the drug convention themselves, a far, we think a far-reaching, harmonized interpretation between human rights and drug control obligations can be, um, is, is visible. Um, a theological and thus a broader interpretation of the medical and scientific exception under the drug control conventions towards a broader criterion of concern for health and welfare of mankind or humankind would ensure a maximum Im implementation of the drug control convention obligations while providing states with the possibility to implement a regulation policy towards cannabis that would better and more effectively protect human rights. Uh, with this harmonized interpretation approach, two additional conditions are supported or follow from, uh, from that approach. Uh, and that must regu uh, uh, accommodate a regulation policy. Uh, first of all, states must implement a policy of discouragement and awareness raising uh, as to the negative effects of cannabis use. And second, states must implement a so-called closed regulating system in the sense that any negative effects of the regulation policy towards other countries should be diminished as much as possible. To conclude, uh, on the basis of our research, we conclude that for a state to be able to implement a policy of regulation towards, towards cannabis for recreational use, five primary conditions must be met. Uh, first of all, the regulation policy should protect interests that are relevant from human rights perspective. Uh, second, the state must substantiate uh, genuinely and in good faith that the regulation policy would provide a better, more effective protection of human rights than policy of prohibition. Uh, the decision to implement a policy of regulation should be rooted in societal support and national democratic decision-making processes. Fourth, the state should implement a closed system of regulation whereby the state monitors that it is, its policy does not affect other states negatively. And lastly, uh, a state that proceeds with regulation of cannabis for recreational use should ensure an adequate policy of discouragement, limitation and increased public awareness as to the risks associated with the recreational use of cannabis. Um, if a state is able to satisfy these conditions under cur current international law, it can legitimately prioritize the human rights obligations over and above any conflicting obligations arising from the UN Narcotic Drug Conventions. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. Um, I give the floor to next one. <laughs> Robert. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I my the, the topic I was asked to speak on was um, a right role for human rights in the 21st century approach to drug control. And um, because I knew that Rick and Masha were going to address in detail the uh, issues of uh, conflicts uh, between the human rights and drug control treaties, I interpreted this actually in a different way. And what I'm going to be doing is um, uh, basically articulating a vision for the future in terms of issues that, that I think perhaps would be useful to address in human rights terms going forward. 
Having said this, nevertheless, uh, I would like to make a, a general comment about the, um, uh, the relationship between the human rights treaties uh, and that legal framework and the three drug control treaties. I think in general, um, what Rick said in particular is, is very accurate. 80 to 90 percent of the human rights violations actually have nothing to do with the drug control treaties themselves. They have to do with the way individual governments have gone beyond the drug control treaties and violated human rights in terms of achieving what they view as their objectives in, in, in the so-called declare war on drugs. There are tensions between the two systems, but I think um, there is sufficient flexibility in the three drug control treaties um, uh, to take into account human rights and to um, provide for a, uh, an interpretation that's consistent with human rights. And let me, um, let me just uh, perhaps explain that position. The 1988 uh, uh, UN Convention Against Illicit Trafficking, Traffic in Narcotic uh, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances, actually in its uh, Article 3, which deals with um, offenses and sanctions, actually has safeguard clauses um, for uh, the enforcement of criminal sanctions. Um, and, it, and in both cases, uh, it's in article, uh, it's in paragraph one and in paragraph uh, three, I believe. In both cases, it says subject to, um, subject to its constitutional principles and the basic concepts of its legal system, and then goes on to prescribe certain action. This creates an enormous flexibility because human rights is actually part of the constitutional framework and basic legal system of most uh, countries. Um, the, uh, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is wi widely ratified as is the economic, the International Covenant on um, uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, as well as as many of the other treaties, such as the, the Convention Against Torture and uh, uh, the, 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 the conventions that deal with discrimination. So anyway, that's, th there are, I would argue that most cases can be resolved within the flexibility provided for, but that human rights has to be taken into account and is taken into account in most good, in most good faith interpretations. So anyway, now having said that, I'm going to go back to my non-conventional presentation, which deals with 11 or 12 ideas uh, looking forward that um, one might want to consider in terms of future vision for addressing human rights. Uh, my first idea is that is, an, is not a new idea, it's an old idea. No person should be convicted or punished for possession or use of drugs. Um, there, are three, there are four options for this. There's decriminalization that's been practiced in, already in some form in about 30 states. There's depenalization where it remains criminal, but there's no custodial sentence. It's treated possibly like a traffic ticket with a fine or maybe some minor community work and no, and no criminal record. Uh, the third option is uh, uh, encouraging states to have a moratorium, either officially or unofficially, on the enforcement of drug laws um, against personal possession and use. I would argue that all three of those actually fall within the flexibility um, of the uh, three drug conventions. And then the final option is legalization, and legalization clearly falls outside of a good faith interpretation of the uh, um, of the three drug conventions. Um, the second idea I would promote, or suggest anyway, would be to have a, an in-depth an in look at the issue of thresholds that distinguish personal possession and use from trafficking. In many countries, these thresholds are set extraordinarily low. And so even trace amounts in a syringe, uh, uh, very small quantities, um, push, push the offense from personal use and possession to trafficking with dis disastrous consequences for the individual's concern. And I think this needs to be looked at much more carefully across the board. There should be comparisons. There should be uh, 
there should be recommendations uh, made on the subject because um, once you're once once you're pushed into the traffic category, um, it's a whole different ball game in terms of uh, the kind of treatment you get in the criminal justice system. Which actually leads to my third suggestion, and this again uh, is addressed in the UNGAS outcome document and, and during the build-up to UNGAS, which deals with the whole issue of graduated penalties for drug trafficking. Um, a drug trafficker who's just over the limit of these thresholds is different, should be treated differently from somebody who's importing one kilo of cocaine and somebody who's importing 100 kilos of cocaine. Um, their whole set of circumstances. And again, um, this is a major issue. I, I at, at our office, I had an inquiry from our head of our Cambodian office that said, what's our position? Um, uh, the government's proposing to have life sentencing for all traffickers. I was like, hold on. All traffickers aren't created equally. And this violates some of the basic premises of due process and fundamental fairness. My fourth idea is to look into the phenomena, this is a little bit out there, look at the phenomena of smuggling drugs into prison, where drugs are widespread in most prisons, but are primarily for personal use. What happens is that the spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or family member smuggles drugs in, these people are eventually caught, these people end up in prison, and this is all for personal use. This is a, this is a negative, negative feedback loop. And I, I think this deserves study, it merits attention, um, uh, and recommendations should be possibly made about decriminalization. This issue obviously is also tied to the issue of harm reduction being made available in prisons, because harm reduction is made available in prisons, and it's actually only a minority of states that provide that, this at the present time then probably you'd have less smuggling. But you probably will have smuggling to some extent in any event. And this is primarily for personal use, and it just puts more people in prison for really no purpose at all. Which leads me to my fifth recommendation, harm reduction. Um, it's fantastic that it's been officially endorsed in the UNGAS outcome document, um, but now is the time for action, now is the time for increased advocacy, and again, particularly of course, in the general population, but also um, in prison populations. My sixth idea is a simple one, and it's actually in on gas, uh, and it's actually the subject of a WHO publication, but it's <laughs> undertaking further advocacy for reducing uh, opioid overdose deaths. Um, estimates by um, uh, various sources uh, indicate that you could save tens of thousands of lives a year for example, if Naxalone was more widely available, not only for first responders, but also friends and family who have can, 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 uh, drug users who can administer it with very minimum, uh, uh, minimum training. Um, there's a publication by WHO on this, but it's, it's, it's seen as a, sort of a technical subject, but it's not. It's a right to life issue because so many lives are potentially affected. Um, my next, uh, my next idea is to have an increased focus on the particular vulnerabilities of women uh, who use drugs, and uh, in particular in three areas, women who use drugs and who are also sex workers. Um, they seem to get it from all sides. Uh, they're subject to uh, pressure to have drugs, by, uh, uh, have sex with the... the corrupt police officers or, or pay bribes. Um, uh, there's the issue of women who may be minor tra traffickers, the so-called mules. And then there's finally the issue of women who um, uh, use drugs and uh, are pregnant. Again, um, women strike me as having a very specific vulnerability, and there's much more scope for uh, some comprehensive studies in this area. Um, my next idea uh, is to monitor more closely uh, attempts to limit the flow of information about health information to drug users uh, or public expression of support for either decriminalization, depenalization, or legalization of drug use. Now again, I come back to the tensions between human rights and uh, the drug treaties. Um, again, the 1988 treaty uh, actually indicates that it should be a criminal offense to publicly incite or induce others 
uh, to use narcotic drugs or uh, psychotropic uh, substances illicitly. Now, uh, when we prepared our report and, not, and uh, to the Human Rights Council in 2015, we received reports that in one country, um, uh, uh, NGOs who, and, and uh, activists who were involved in um, uh, providing needles and uh, needles and syringes, clean needles and syringes to drug users, uh, providing information about um, uh, safe ways to take drugs, harm reduction services in general. They were subject to prosecution because they were seen as infringing uh, this, uh, this prohibition, which, as I said, is subject to the safeguard clause. And there have been cases, there are cases in Brazil involving both uh, freedom of expression, freedom of um, uh, peaceful assembly, uh, saying that the, um, the uh, campaigns, uh, the, 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 the freedom of expression was promoting drug use. Fortunately, it was resolved uh, largely in favor of the, value, the human rights values of freedom of expression and freedom of peaceful assembly. But this is the kind of thing where um, uh, it involves a flexible reading of of the, the um, offenses and sanctions uh, provision of the 1988 um, convention uh, along with basic human rights values. Um, my ninth idea is that in the criminal justice area, one should look at uh, laws or judicial procedures that are different for drug-related offenses than other types of drug offenses. The problem is that when it's different, it's probably worse and it probably offends human rights. Um, uh, there are significant issues with drug courts. Uh, there are significant issues with uh, trying uh, drug traffickers in military courts. Um, there are some other issues concerning limitations on parole or pardon or even registering uh, 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 people who have been arrested and charged and delaying, and delaying their pretrial detention. Um, my tenth, uh, my tenth uh, idea, I only have 12, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, the continued campaign uh, uh, to uh, prohibit the use of the death penalty for drug-related offenses. Rick made an allusion to this. Um, the Human Rights Committee, in a series of three concluding observations uh, on individual countries, said the same thing, that um, uh, the use of the death penalty for drug-related offenses was incompatible with human rights law. As, as Rick noticed, uh, remark rather, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing in the uh, three drug control uh, treaties which mandates the death penalty for um, drug related offenses. My 11th idea uh, concerns children. And again, um, I find the focus on children somewhat generalized. Um, in literature, there's, there's been some excellent work done, uh, but this is, these are my ideas. Um, it strikes me that children and adolescents who use drugs come from a wide variety of backgrounds. You have some children who are born into extremely poor situations that may get involved with drugs uh, and even trafficking in drugs it is simply a survival mechanism. You may have some children who uh, get involved with drugs uh, uh, because they come from highly dysfunctional families uh, uh, where there's violence. Uh, they may go from foster home to foster home, and basically they start off life with a very bleak, bleak future. You have middle-class children who use drugs, and you have children from privileged families who use drugs. So the motivations and the circumstances why children use drugs in adolescence is very different. And I think it would be interesting to try and measure where along the continuum uh, is this respective drug use for children and adolescents to try and analyze what obstacles uh, or, or what one um, exists to, to treatment. And then also to look at, for these different groups, are the sets of support the same or are they differentiated? Does the the first two categories, do they have uh, access um, to the same level of uh, health care, uh, social support, 
uh, education about uh, the effects of drugs, social services, as, as, as those kids from middle class families or privileged families. I just think this is an area that could uh, benefit from a lot more research. And my final idea, and it's just uh, to conclude, uh, relates to uh, the use of drugs by indigenous peoples in their traditional cultural and religious practices. Um, in spite of the language in the uh, 1961 treaty, I would argue that there is um, sufficient flexibility in the treaties to allow this. Again, it deals with the safeguard clauses, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples is, is protected in human rights law, and um, arguably one experiences religion individually <laughs> for individual use. But I think you can make an argument. But what we lack is a baseline knowledge of what states are doing. We know, we have limited knowledge in the United States, for example, uh, which is not exactly a, a friend of lax enforcement of, of drug laws. Uh, they actually have a, a Supreme Court decision and a legislation that allows uh, the, something called the American Indian Church to use peyote, which is a controlled subject, uh, substance in their uh, ceremony, uh, their, their traditional ceremonies. Um, but what, what we don't know, we don't really have a baseline of information of what the practices in other states, uh, most other states, about um, what the attitude of the authorities is. I suspect that it's, it's allowed, even though it's technically illegal, and the authorities just, just ignore it. Um, but it would be interesting to have a baseline of information, and I think here it would be interesting to get some of the indigenous human rights mechanisms, such as the Permanent Forum in New York and the uh, Expert Mechanism in uh, Geneva to get involved with this and help perhaps do a study. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Robert, for this uh, very clear summary and for putting forward the expertise of the UN Office of the High Commission on Human Rights. Okay, well, thank you very much for these three presentations, and I'll give the floor for the next side events then. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.